I always say where it rains, it can flood. Flooding does not care about jurisdictional lines. It doesn't care about politics. That's Laura Lightbody. She directs Pew's work aiming to reduce the impact of flood-related disasters on taxpayers, communities, and the environment. And that impact isn't small. Which brings us to our data point. Flood-related damage added up to $850 billion over the past two decades. Some states are working to get a handle on this problem, and we'll hear about South Carolina's efforts in this episode as we continue our look at states of innovation. Welcome to After the Fact. For the Pew Charitable Trust, I'm Dan LaDuke. As we're about to hear, flooding is a big concern in many parts of this country, and those concerns extend beyond coastal areas, fueled by a growing population. From 2000 to 2010, 10%, we've seen a U.S. population increase. And for this, this decade that we're rounding out right now, it's looking about that same percentage. If you think about what we've done over the years, we've built roads and bridges and malls, parking lots, neighborhood developments to accommodate a growing population. And what that has done is we have stripped away green space that used to be there to store and absorb floodwaters. And that compounded by rising seas, more frequent flood disasters are all making these price tags just go up and up and up. And over the decades they have risen. And then you have a national policy framework that is dated and it's really based on sort of reacting to natural disasters. So often when flooding is in the news, we see high water, we, maybe it's a hurricane, maybe it's a river overflowing, and it's all about the aftermath. Right, we've all heard the old adage, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And that's what we're implementing now. We can no longer afford to, from a cost perspective and from an impact in lives perspective, wait for the flood to happen. So states, localities, the federal government are all investing in what's called mitigation, activities that reduce risk before the disaster happens. Research shows that every dollar invested in such activities, buying out properties, enhancing those stormwater systems that you see in your neighborhood, those activities result in a six dollar, an average of six dollar savings. That's a huge return on investment that local governments can really get behind and that prove to work and reduce that impact when a flood does come down into your neighborhood. And there's emerging research now, the scientists and researchers and academia have all kind of looked at the best way of coping with all of this flooding and increasingly these ways that nature plays a role are, are becoming more effective, more beneficial to other things, not just flooding. We're talking about impact to water quality, habitat, not just sort of absorbing that flood water. There are multiple benefits of letting nature rule. Nature is really our best partner in reducing risk and adapting to these increasing floods that we're talking about. Sounds like this new approach is like, we're supposed to talk about flooding when it's dry. A number of states as diverse as Texas and New Jersey and Virginia and elsewhere are starting to make some significant investments in this area. What are some of the things that they're doing? We've been really pleased to see, as you mentioned, states across the country, not just sort of the traditional states that we think of that flood, maybe those southeastern states. But as you mentioned, New Jersey, Iowa, states are being really proactive. And it's it's because they're just up against these un bearable costs. And the federal government is too. And the federal government has said to states over and over again, states have to start preparing for these events and investing in these events. We all remember Hurricane Harvey battered Texas nearly two years ago, left nearly 90 people dead. It cost an estimated $125 billion in damage, property and infrastructure. 200,000 homes and businesses. And so as a reaction to that, the state took some really bold steps. It first, the legislature passed a series of bills that are very proactive in terms of A, making sure that the community could recover from Hurricane Harvey, rebuild in a resilient way, 
And then B, really make sure that the next time a Hurricane Harvey comes, they're prepared. They mandated a statewide plan, right? That means looking across the watershed. There's multiple watersheds within the state. It's important because it means that states are coordinating their investments, their projects, their planning across the entire state rather than fixing it community by community. The second thing they did is they put some real money on the table. The state itself invested $800 million in mitigation projects. That is a large amount of money. It's almost three times the amount that the federal government put towards mitigation in 2019. And so that money is going to translate into real mitigation projects that reduce risk across the state. What's going on in this field right now that starts to feel like new and that is actually making a difference? This is a problem that plagues states, all 50 states. The old traditional way of dealing with flooding is to try to control it, to try to pour concrete. We've moved rivers. And there's a new way of thinking, which a lot of states are really adapting, cities are adopting, which is let's actually try and plan for flooding. Let's look more holistically across the problem. Most recently, South Carolina legislature just passed a new program that would fund mitigation projects like buying out properties that have flooded over and over again. The coast of South Carolina, you probably heard it referred to as the Low Country. This region that Charleston is part of is the South Carolina Low Country. It's it's called that for a reason. It's a very low place. We have vast expanses of estuaries and salt marsh, something like more than 500,000 acres of salt marsh in our region. Laura Cantrell leads the Coastal Conservation League an organization with a mission to protect the natural resources and the quality of life for people who live in the South Carolina coast. More than 2,800 miles of tidal shoreline, so all in up into the nooks and crannies of our bays and sounds and, and other basins. So the interface between the land and the water is very porous. And that means it's a wet region and it's getting wetter because our sea levels are rising and we're having more storms. So we have always been a region that has had to, as the Dutch will say, we have to learn how to live with water and not work against it. And as we learn to live with more water, we're gonna have to be smart about how we do that. One way that South Carolinians are learning to live smarter with all that water is simply preparing and planning for flooding. Funding, of course, is crucial, That's been a job for Representative Merle Smith Jr. as chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee in South Carolina's legislature. In 2015 is what I would say would be the central event that started all this. And we had what was called the thousand year flood in South Carolina. A storm came up through Florida and dumped 18 to 24 inches of rain on areas here in Sumter County. We had a 22 inches of rain. Never in my lifetime, I've lived here since I was nine years old. I'm 52 now. Never saw anything like what, what occurred here, where basically our whole city was underwater for that time. And everyone experienced that flooding. And that's where we realized we're not prepared for this. And it's only getting worse. In 2020, the state took a big step toward flood preparedness. The governor signed legislation that created a new Office of Resilience and a chief resilience officer for the state. Resiliency is a, a great word because it feels to me a little bit like a new approach. A lot of times you hear about flood mitigation. How do we build a big wall? And we've done our duty. And it seems like you all in South Carolina are looking at it from a deeper perspective. How did that way of thinking come about in the legislature? I think some of us who are not from from the coastal areas realize we have flooding too. You know, after the thousand year flood that we had in South Carolina, we saw more rain events here in Sumter County. And I would get calls from my constituents that the stormwater system is not working and our neighborhoods are flooding. You need to call the Department of Transportation and get them to clean out our, our storm pipes. And we realize that, you know, we probably have not invested in that infrastructure for years. And there are flood zones that we should not have allowed to be built in year, you know, for these times that are addressing. And these problems have real consequences to real people. 
Representative Smith told us about a family of veterans and first responders in his district that was hit hard from the 2015 flood he mentioned earlier. Their home was devastated by water damage, leaving them without electricity or the financial means to make repairs. And I'll never forget that. When you look at that and you say, you know, but by the grace of God go I. And seeing that happen to somebody, it brings a realism to you that these, these are real problems. We can talk about them in the abstract, but to go through a flood, if I got flooded or anybody, how do you rebuild? I mentioned all these natural disasters we have, and FEMA comes in here and, and obviously helps pay for a lot of the uh, cleanup and for a lot of the issues. But the one thing FEMA does is they require a statewide match. So every year we've got to come up with a statewide match. But what happens when we are in a recession? And what happens when we don't have the revenue for, for a FEMA match and a natural disaster occurs in South Carolina? And so part of what this did is why don't we look at dealing with the flood issues now? Why don't we put things in there that can help prevent flooding in the future? And also let's make sure we have a steady revenue source where we're going to have money, whether we're in the boom times or the bust times, to have our FEMA match where we can take care of the citizens of the state. So that kind of all culminated into one piece of legislation. We created a disaster relief and resilient reserve fund. Just like we have a rainy day fund for budgetary issues, we're going to have a reserve fund in South Carolina for uh, resiliency issues. We created the South Carolina Office of the Res uh, Resilience and also had chief resiliency option. And nothing passes quickly in South Carolina unless it has overwhelming support. And this literally passed in, in a two-week session. Feels like this is something that is going to cut across a lot of state operations, Department of Transportation and the folks who lay all of the stormwater pipes and all the rest. Is that part of the scope of this, the idea to better coordinate these varied roles of state government? Absolutely. And, and part of what we did was create an advisory group when we did this and realized that there is a lot of state agencies that have roles in, in flood mitigation and or resiliency planning. And so we need to bring them together instead of them being siloed and working separately. Let's bring them together in a coordinated effort to come up with a plan. So, you know, I, I'm looking through this as we brought together the Department of Natural Resources, South Carolina Emergency Management Division, Department of Insurance, the Disaster Recovery Office, Department of Agriculture, the Sea Grant Consortium, the Department of Commerce, Department of Transportation. And then we also gave the resiliency officer to add any other agency that he or she may see fit in their discretion to make sure we cover everybody, to bring them together, require them to work in unison rather than working separately. As lawmakers like Merle Smith continue to work on legislative solutions, organizations like the Coastal Conservation League play an important role, calling for sustainable development across the state with consideration of the environment and how that development will affect residents. Here again is Laura Cantrell. In our role as conservationists and thinking about smart policy and a more holistic way to view our, our ecosystems and our economies and how healthy environments and healthy economies go hand in hand and playing a supporting role to our state leaders. Many other coastal cities, particularly on the East Coast, are experiencing similar problems and, and grappling with them. In in our region and in our city, the double whammy of sea level rise and other implications of a, of a changing climate, coupled with intense development pressure in a very fragile landscape, that combination makes us in many ways the canary in the coal mine. There's lots of water. So the good news is that we know a lot about what needs to be done to address these problems. While the focus on resilience signifies a change in the state's approach to disaster preparedness, Laura Cantrell says resiliency can mean different things to different people. That word and terminology is always tricky, and resilience is often equated with flooding. And in the conversation that you and I are having, we are focused on how we deal with water and flooding and, and how to be resilient to flooding. But we like to think about resilience as the ability to be strong and healthy and the best equipped as possible to cope with increasing threats. 
And in this context, we're talking about the increasing threat of climate change, warming temperatures, rising sea levels, more storms, and more water. So how do we be resilient to that? And not just thinking about recovering from a flooding event and putting things back the way they were, but across the spectrum from planning and preparing, having uh, development patterns that are more sustainable, that are keeping people and property out of harm's way. We're trying to make sure we are, as a region, being smart about how we develop, how we have a high quality of life for people who live here. We're protecting the environment so that it can be the beautiful place that we know and love, but also provide the kind of natural services that that we need to, to be a healthy region. So just a few things that come to mind, local comprehensive planning, zoning efforts. You know, these local plans are what determine what goes where. And so it's really important. And it's important that our public understands the opportunity to engage and participate and provide input and shape the future. Healthy food, healthy people, healthy communities. We think that's resilience. If we're opposed to some particular transportation project because we think that it's going to harm wetlands and exacerbate sprawl on a sea island. Well, that's not just because of a transportation project. It's the health of the wetlands. It's the health of the rural area. It's the ability of the region to withstand threats. It's guiding development in a way that is going to provide a better quality of life for the people who live here. It is all connected and it does all lead to our definition of resilience. If you want to learn more about how communities in South Carolina and elsewhere are preparing for flooding, visit pewtrust.org slash after the fact. And we hope you'll join us next week for our next episode in our States of Innovation season. Before we sign off, we'd love to hear from you please consider taking our short listener survey at pew.org slash ATF survey. For the Pew Charitable Trusts, I'm Dan LaDuke. Thanks for listening.